What is the standard model since 1952 when people say, you know, to high school students, to college students, how life began? What do they say? It's not only the standard model to high school students, it's the standard model to college students, it's the standard model to graduate students. It's in all of their textbooks, and, and from middle school through graduate school. And it is the, the uh, uh, primordial soup model. There is a pond, there's a body of water, and there are molecules in that body of water. <clears throat> there are some lightning strikes, and the molecules start coming together, and then they assemble into cells. Those cells start coming together, and you get little creatures that start swimming around in that pond. And then those creatures end up coming out of the pond and start populating the earth. That's the primordial suit model. That's what's taught. But I remember the, the night we were talking about it, part of my astonishment was the fact that I haven't thought about this. Because as I said, we all argue, or many people argue about evolution and all that kind of stuff. But, but nobody ever talks about how you get life from non-life. It's one thing to talk about we have some life, and how can it modify? How can it change? How does that happen? How do you go from a single cell to a lizard? But to talk about there's no life, and then suddenly there's life. So scientists today would say life appeared 4 billion years ago. We know that. Yes, it appeared immediately after the cooling of the Earth. When I say immediately, sub 100 million, maybe 50 million years, which on a geological time scale, is, is very, very rapidly. There's evidence for life immediately upon the cooling of the Earth after the heavy bombardment when the Earth was pelted with many meteorites that, that actually filled our, our surface of our planet with many different elements. So scientists, when you ask them how life began, they will tell you, yes, uh, we know it began four billion years ago. Exactly, single-celled life appeared. So. You can agree with that, but then you say, right, it appeared. How did that happen? And you say that, I mean, at, at the end of the day, they always point us back to this 1952 experiment. And I remember you telling me that it's been 70 years since that experiment. And they were so hopeful. They thought, we produced amino acids we're on our way. Do they know what amino acids are? I mean, you're throwing out chemical names yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let me just say stuff. Um, the building blocks of protein. Um, but I remember you explaining this to me, and I remember thinking, you know what? I, I, never, I never think about this. So you said that in those 70 years, the assumption was that they created amino acids and then that they would then be able to do the next step and the next step and the next step and, and they would begin to fig eventually figure out how you get single-celled life. Yes. And so it's been 70 years. How are they doing on that? Not very well. Nobody, nobody has ever made a cell. Nobody has ever, so you get amino acids. It was an amazing experiment. So, so set up an experiment with a flask with very simple compounds, ammonia, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and, and uh, oxygen, and you start putting in voltage pulses to simulate um, uh, lightning strikes, and you get amino acids formed. These amino acids were, were not handed. They did not have optical activity, meaning that our hands are non-superimposable mirror images. If I put my right hand up to a mirror, I would see an image of my left hand. That's why my right hand does not fit into a left-handed glove properly. They are non-superimposable mirror images. You cannot insert one into the other. The vast majority of molecules are like that in biological systems. They had the two-handed, they had both molecules mixed together. How you got one, which is what you need for life, uh, nobody knew. But at that time, they didn't know that you really had to have only the one hand and not the other. So even, even Miller and Yuri thought it was going to come very quickly, and then they, they've confessed it, it really didn't come very quickly. I mean, this is... It never came. Never came. Never came. Not, not only... Not only I, I, I mean, 
we're so far from that that the, it's become harder to get than it was in 1952. It's become harder. See, that's the key. <clears throat> yes, that's the key. Is that you said, I remember you saying to me, and I, see, I find this all funny, actually. This is like so delightful to me that they're all excited because the, the idea is that science, if they remove the God hypothesis, they would say single-celled life emerged by itself through random processes. And in 1952, they were able to create some amino acids, and they just thought, we've got it, we're on our way. But what you're saying is that the more time passed, they were not able to move the ball forward. In fact, you said it's like they moved the ball backwards. The more you learn, the more you realize we're not doing this. So the goalpost got further away because what happens is the cell doesn't change, but the, the, uh, we understand more about the complexity of the cell. And all of a sudden we're like, oh, I'm gonna have to build that too. Oh, I will have to build that too. So the complexity as we learn it, you're like, this is crazy. So the, the ball hasn't moved backward, but the goalpost has moved further away. And so we were much further from the target than we were from the goalpost than we were in 1952 because of the things that we have learned, which are, which are amazing, just amazing. And so how does a cell do this if we can't make a single cell? The cell does this because it, it takes all of this information. When a cell divides, it splits it between its two sides, and then it pinches down in the middle. And so it keeps spreading this. We have no idea how to do that. No idea. But it's been 70 years. 70 years. They've been time. working on this hard. And you're telling me that, I mean, there's two pieces of information here. A, you're telling me they've been working on this puzzle of how you get life from non-life. They've been working on it hard day and night for 70 years. Um, OK. It, it actually even predated that. That was the big experiment that they thought they were right on the verge. That was like the kickoff yes. that they thought, we're on our way now. Yeah. And, but what you're saying is that the more we learn about the details of what's required to create the simplest life imaginable, which is a single cell, the more we've discovered how complex the cell is. So that's what you're saying, the goalpost is, <laughs> is moving away. The ball is still here, but the goalpost is like flying across the universe. Yes, yes, it's moving much faster than the ball is moving forward. The ball makes nanometer increments as it goes forward. Well, okay, but so then this brings up the, the biggest question. I mean, you describe this in detail. You've got lots of videos. By the way, you have a YouTube channel. DR James Tour. DR James Tour, okay, because there are going to be people watching this who really want to get into this. And you do get into this. But what's so fascinating to me, what, what really kills me, is that you know this world of nanoscience. And you know that they've been working on this 70 years. And you know that not only haven't they moved the ball forward, but the goalposts are like speeding away and you're calling them on it. In other words, you are saying, excuse me, I know what you know, and I know what you don't know, and I know you're blowing smoke <laughs> because you have gone after some of these folks because they're making claims that we've pretty much got this figured out, and you're saying no. I'm saying no. And, and uh, it's bothering the community. And uh, uh, what, what community? What community? The origin of life community. There are researchers. There's a community? Yes. There's researchers that work in this area of origin of life, and they have meetings together, and they discuss the progress. And uh, it doesn't go anywhere. Can you imagine doing that for a 40-year career? And, and you're further away from the goal than when you started 40 years ago. And so they keep saying that we're going to have life in uh, Lee Cronin said it in 2011 that it'll, he'll, he'll hopefully make life in his lab within two years. He said this in 2011? 2011. He didn't, he was not successful. Just doing the math, I'm thinking, 
Maybe that didn't, maybe that didn't happen. Jack Sostek at Harvard, a Nobel Prize winner, said in 2014 he'd have life in his lab made within three to five years. He missed that date. Uh, but um, but did, you see, but yeah. again, you're so understated. I know from what little I have watched of your videos at DR James Tour on YouTube that it, it would be like saying, I'm going to have a car uh, in two years, right? And then you find out that I don't even have any idea how to make a wheel or a motor. In other words, to, to make a claim about a car when you don't know how to make a motor or you don't even have the beginnings of knowing how to make a single piston, how would you dare to talk about a car? Right, it, it's even more than that, Eric. It, it's, it's in the 1500s saying, I will be on the moon in two years. We've, we've, not, we've not gotten flight. We've not gotten space travel. We have no idea. There's no infrastructure for that. And if you had said that in 1500, you would get locked up. And, and that's what it's like. We can't make the four basic classes of chemicals. I'm not going to say their name. But the four basic classes oh, of chemicals. Oh, just for laughs. Tell us what are the four basic classes of chemicals. Well, one is the young lady that you dated, lipids. Lipids. All right. I said I, I think I dated a lipid. I can't say for sure. Another is carbohydrates, which are your potatoes. Uh, but they're a very important class of compounds. Those are the hardest ones to make. Uh, another one is the amino acids and the proteins that, that are formed from amino acids. And the other are the nu nucleic acids, which are the DNA and the RNA, which are actually a sugar, a carbohydrate with a base on it, and a phosphate group. And so those are the four classes of molecules that we need. We can't even make those in a prebiotically relevant manner. And any papers that publish and say we've made it in a prebiotically relevant manner are absolute junk and nonsense. And that's what I am exposing. And, and, uh, uh, and of course, it bothers the community. <laughs> we don't want to bother the community. Um, but again, I, I, I find this funny, because as I've watched your videos, it's so obvious that they're not even, you know, to say somebody's not close, it's all degrees and, it, and it's all subjective. I mean, they're not in the same galaxy. Like we're talking about something, when, when, when you talk about what the simplest life is, it's a level of complexity that is like almost incomprehensible. And they're still claiming that it came together by itself through random sloshing in the prebiotic soup. And you're, you're calling on that. On yeah, that. yeah. So, so people have computed because they'll keep saying cells were much simpler back then than they are now. Before the war. <laughs> before, the, before the war. Yeah, everything was much simpler back then. Yeah, OK. But I mean, yeah. how simple. <laughs> I didn't know that one. How simple, um, you know, when somebody says, no, because I want to be clear that I, I, until I started looking into your stuff, you know, when you think of what, what is a cell, it's a membrane. And there's a, there's a nucleus. So it's like a jelly donut. I mean, how complex could it be? What is it? But at, the more you look into it, the more you realize, oh my goodness. It's a factory. It is an entire, it's, a factory. it's like a universe of complexity. Yes, yes. It's, it's, it's like flying over New York City at 30,000 feet and thinking, oh, that's, that's interesting. Or going down on the street and seeing the infrastructure and then under the streets and seeing the infrastructure. And everywhere you look, there's this complexity that you never saw at 30,000 okay, feet. So in the early part of the 20th century, we couldn't see much of that complexity. It was just a bunch of protoplasm. OK. Very easy. Which is like a made up word, like jelly donut. In, 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 in the beginning of the 20th century. In the beginning so, of the 20th yes. century. Yes. And, and so that kind of gave people hope, like, well, we'll, we'll figure this out. Right. And, then they begin discovering what is in the nucleus and what is a membrane. I mean, a membrane, even that word, you think, OK, membrane. Well, uh, t talk about the complexity of what is a membrane. So it's a bilayer membrane. What you have is you have, two, you, 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 you have two layers. And what's happened is the two layers are different. The outer membrane, which is the world in which is, it sees, 
is different than the inner membrane where the nucleus and, and the endoplasmic reticulum and all this DNA is, is, is working is different. And so every quote unquote protocell that people have made, they say, well, this is, this is the beginnings of a cell. They've, they've, never had, they've never had the inside different than the outside. So all their protocells are a bunch of nonsense. They could never work. There's a reason for that because you have to have what's called a proton gradient. I'm not going to explain it, okay? You don't have I'm not going to ask you to explain it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's because the, the hydrogens, the hydrogen atoms that have lost an electron are called a proton, and they can move in and out, but they, they stay on one side more than the other because the two sides are different. If the two sides are the same, you don't get that gradient. All their protocells are a bunch of garbage. They're experts in origin of life that say, it's just like making salad dressing, which is crazy, which is absolutely crazy, because, because you, you have these little bubbles in salad dressing. First of all, those are not vesicles where you have an inner and an hour later and a middle, but there are ways to make vesicles, but they're, it could never work. What you've made and you've called even your membrane, without even worrying about the stuff in it, it could never work. That's just the membrane layer. Then you have all the stuff in it. People will say, all you need is a piece of RNA. That's a bunch of nonsense. It's been calculated all the different things you need to have a cell to work. Not only have they not made all of those things, they haven't even made one of them. It's a list of about 25 things. They haven't even made one of them. Not even one. OK, so but they're still asking us to believe that a lifeless universe, through random sloshing, made every single one of these things, and then assembled every single one of these things in this exquisite order that eventually ends up being what we call life. And we, let's be honest, like we can't even define what life is, correct? That's correct. So if you have a cell, a cell that just dies, we're just talking about a little cell, a yeast cell, a very simple cell, not, not, even, not even a human cell, it's a very simple cell just dies. Ask a scientist, what is it that we just lost? What is it that we just lost? I did this experiment once. I don't know if my daughter will remember. I had a bunch of scientists over for dinner, and, and I said, watch, watch this. I said, I have a cell. It just died. What, what is it that we just lost? One guy said, it's, it's the ionic potentials. The other said, stop on. It's much lost much more than ionic potential. They could not even agree on what it was that we just lost, let alone how you define life. You can talk about the characteristics of life, characteristics of, a, uh, of life, you, you, you can specify, but what is the life? What is it that you just lost? Scientists can't even define that, let alone make it. And that's why I say that, that even if I gave you a cell, if I gave you a cell that just died, Go ahead, bring it back to life. In other words, you're saying if, 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 a, if a cell dies, every single one of the parts is there. Is there. In other words, I'll give you that. Yeah. Now make them work. Yes, because, because a resurrection should be easier than a bottom-up synthesis. You know, everything's there. Everything, all the parts are kind of in place. Now bring it back to life. Can anybody do that? There's not a scientist in the right mind, who will say that they can do that? Even origin of life people say, would never say that they, they, they can do that. They won't say they can't do it because they won't admit it, but they'll just look at you. <laughs> That's what they do, they just look at you. They say, can you do it? They just look at me. By not answering you, they're obviously saying something. Yes. 